Uh, my name's Chad. I've been a public health nurse on the infectious disease team since later in the year in 2020 and may have spoken with many of you over this period. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce a presentation by members of the vaccine preventable disease team. Um, this will be led by Susan Bruce, who's a public health nurse on the team. Um, and she'll discuss influenza vaccines specifically. She'll be accompanied by Raquel, who's a fourth year nursing student with Southwestern Public Health, and she'll give some general vaccine reminders, and then as well as our VPD program assistant, Amy, who will discuss COVID vaccines in particular. Um, before we begin, I would just like to say that I, I put together some certificates of achievement for facilities that reached uh, influenza immunization rate of 90% or higher for staff last year, so for 2021 to 2022, or for facilities that had a significant improvement from the previous year. And I will be doing the same certificates for this current season, so 2022 to 2023. So just remember to encourage vaccination for influenza um, this year for all staff and all residents. Um, but without any further ado, I will pass this over to Susan, who will start her presentation. Great, thank you very much. So as Chad mentioned, this is Susan, and I will be discussing influenza vaccine today. So the first thing that I'll remind you is that anyone that has a fridge that stores vaccine should have a cooler that looks similar to that with all the goodies that are inside of it so that you can safely store your vaccine. So flu vaccine and general vaccines are stored between two and eight degrees Celsius. Um, if you're missing any of the um, required equipment for that cooler, please let your Southwestern Public Health contact know. Your cooler can be used for transporting the vaccine. So if you pick the vaccine up or if you're taking it somewhere, it is also used for storage when there is an adverse storage condition, so your temperature range goes out of range in your fridge, you can store it in there short term. When you have an adverse storage condition, please report to Southwestern Public Health immediately, forwarding a copy of your logbook, as well as your vaccine inventory that we then will follow up to see whether the vaccine is still uh, able to be used. All homes and hospitals and facilities have a contingency plan, so make sure that all the staff know that, that if it's um, at a different time of day when you're not there, what they're supposed to do with that vaccine and whom to call, and a reminder that vaccines shall, should not be stored in an uninspected fridge, so only the fridges that have passed inspection. So having said that, we'll now discuss the 2022 flu vaccine. So it is important to get vaccinated because the number of seniors in Ontario is growing rapidly and they are vulnerable to serious complications. Vaccination for them is the best defense. So long-term care, retirement home, and even hospitals are congregate settings where there's people at risk for transmitting the virus, as well as people who are at risk of the disease itself. Each year, respiratory illnesses like flu cause countless outbreaks in long-term care, retirement homes, and even hospitals, and they result in resident staff illness, staffing challenges, missed work, visitor impact, and home disruptions. So who should get first vac vaccinated first? So for the month of October, anyone over 65, those that have um, high risk health conditions, some of which are listed on the slide, Indigenous people and healthcare workers. So in Oxford and Elgin, all the vaccine for flu has arrived and has been packed if your order is in. Um, so everyone has had the opportunity uh, to pick up their vaccine and immunize. In November, it will flu vaccine will be available for the general population. So the vaccine products that we will see in long-term care, retirement, home, and hospitals include two products for those that are under 65 years of age. So Fluvalt Tetra and Fluzone Quadrivalent, both familiar products for those of you that have participated in the flu vaccination program before. 
both quadrivalent products. For over 65, we have the same products as last year. So we have the two quadrivalents that we can use for under 65 as well. In a pinch, that you can use those. The two products that are specific for seniors are the Fluzone High Dose and the flu ad, which is a trivalent, but it has an adjuvant, a booster in it to help it work better. So for 65 and over, the flu zone high dose, and do be careful because if you have both flu zone quadrivalent and the flu zone high dose quadrivalent, the packaging does look quite similar. So just take an extra moment before you administer it to make sure you have the right product. So the flu zone high dose has four times the antigen count. It protects against four strains of the virus, two A's and two B's. And a reminder that the dosage is 0.7, which is a little uh, different than in most of the other vaccines that we give. So the flu ad, which is a trivalent with the adjuvant, protects against three strains, two A's and one B. It has 515 micrograms, but it has the adjuvant that gives it a boost, which will offer the higher protection. A reminder, do not administer either flu ad or flu zone high dose to anyone under 65 years of age, even if they are living in a long-term care or retirement setting. So the quadrivalent products are similar to other years, anyone over six months of age for strain protection, so those will be for your residents, staff, patients, and volunteers under 65 years of age. So if you're not sure what to give, you give the first available and age appropriate vaccine. So I will share that high dose flu zone does offer better protection than the flu zone quad or the flu of Altetra, so the other quadrivalent products. So if you have flu zone high dose, you would give that over the other two quadrivalent products. If you have both flu zone high dose and flu ad in your fridge, so I'll remind you, NASI says again that the high dose would be better than the other quadrivalent products, but it, it does not have prefer preferential recommendation for the use of the quadrivalent high dose versus the, um, the flu ad for this age group. Use what you have. So the reason that they're not going to say that the quadrivalent high dose is better than the flu ad is because the burden of disease for seniors is an A strain, and both the flu ad and the high dose flu zone have that A strain coverage. So the flu ad is missing one of the Bs, but it is not the disease we see in the seniors. So both flu ad and high dose flu zone are good products for your seniors. If all of those are gone and you have a new resident or a new patient, then use the quadrivalent product. So contraindications and precautions are the same as uh, other years with the flu vaccine. So previous issues with the vaccine. I will remind you that egg allergy is not a contraindication uh, for, again, and that's not new uh, for the 2022-23 flu season. So to order the influenza vaccine for hospitals and long-term care, um, you should have received a fax, an email, and then on your first order, you would have received the vaccine order form. We need the order form by Monday at 3.30. Your order will be ready for pickup Thursday of that same week. You need to send a copy of your temperature log with your facility name on the top with each order. And best practice says to store one month of flu vaccine or any vaccine in your fridge at any one time. And please stick with the Mondays at 3.30. We have a lot of orders coming in, so that helps us make sure we have your order on time. So for retirement homes that have pre-qualified, you will follow the very same process um, as the long-term care and the hospital, so Monday at 3.30. For retirement homes that did not pre-qualify, 
they, uh, your residents will have an option of going to any participating pharmacy anywhere in Ontario. They can follow up with the healthcare provider, or you as a home can contact the local pharmacy to inquire about in-home immunization. Some may um, offer that, some may not. So just contact who's ever local to you. I will remind you that unlike COVID vaccine that can travel all over, flu vaccine cannot cross borders from where it was uh, the vaccine was obtained from. So pharmacies must stay within Southwestern Public Health. So if you have a pharmacy that comes to your facility and they're from New Hamburg, which is out of South, Southwestern Public Health region, they cannot administer the flu shot in your home. So reporting wastage is the same for all other vaccines. You will use the return form that you can find online or you can touch base with your Southwestern Public Health contact. New though is that you're not to return open vials to us, but you need to report them on the order form. So if you have a multi-dose flu vaccine and you only administer eight of it and it's expired, you would just report the two wasted doses on this form, but you would not return the vial to the health care. So the reporting requirements in, for influenza for both long-term care and hospitals, they are required to report staff immunization rates Long-term care also need to report uh, resident rates by mid to late January. That information will be forwarded uh, when we get it from your infectious disease team. Best practice tips, just remind you, you should not pre-draw vaccine and leave it in the fridge. Uh, it increases the risk of contamination. Store the vaccine in the original box. For multi-dose, label both the box and the vial in case there's multiple that are open in there so you know exactly which one was open when. We suggest you follow Public Health Ontario's guidelines that you uh, discard the vaccine after 28 days. And I did put a link in the references to that, uh, even if the manufacturer says that it's good for a longer period of time. Shake the vaccine gently before use and don't use it if it looks unusable to you. I'll turn it over to Raquel. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Raquel. Uh, thanks for having me today. I'll be going through some of the routine vaccinations that are available for individuals in long term care homes, for retirement homes, and in hospitals. So, to begin, we'll start off with this slide for publicly funded vaccinations. Some of which are listed on the screen here are the ones I'm using. So more specifically to the publicly funded vaccinations, um, the first vaccination that I'll go into is the shingles. So shingles is a painful rash that appears on one side of the body. For individuals who have had um, chicken pox before, that virus lays dormant in their body and can present as shingles later in life. And as we age, risk of getting shingles and experiencing the complications also increase. So the Shingrix vaccine is publicly funded to individuals 65 to 70 years of age. And they are publicly funded for two doses, um, in which the second dose can be given two to six months after the first. Um, and it protects against shingles and post-therapeutic neuralgia, uh, which is a serious complication um, to shingles, which causes nerve common question that many people have is if an individual has had shingles before, how long should they wait before receiving shingles? Um, and the answer to that is one minute. Moving on to the next vaccination, we have the pneumococcal vaccination um, in which pneumococcal infections are caused by pneumococcus, which, outbreak, which outcomes can range from ear and sinus infection to pneumonia and bloodstream infection. Uh, one vaccine to protect against this is Prevnar 13. Um, and one dose is publicly funded for high risk individuals 50 years and older. The high risk eligibility criteria is listed on the screen here. Another vaccine that protects against pneumococcal disease is Pneumovax 23. And one dose is publicly funded for clients over the age of 65 years. Uh, high-risk clients under 65 and residents of nursing homes, homes of the age and chronic care facilities or ward 
regardless of age. So high-risk eligibility criteria, um, as I previously just said, is the criteria listed on the screen. If an individual is unsure if they are eligible for the vaccination, they can contact their health care. Um, a booster dose of the Pneumovax 23 um, can be given five years later based on the eligibility on the screen. Um, and it is important to note here, if an, if an individual is eligible for both vaccines, one dose of Pneumovax 23 should be given um, more than eight weeks after the last dose of Pregnar 13. Or if Pneumovax 23 was given first, Pregnar 13 should be given more than one year after. Moving on to the last vaccination I'll talk about today is the tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. Uh, tetanus is, causes a painful stiffening of the muscles and can enter the body entering an open wound, so like stepping on a rusty needle. Diphtheria can lead to breathing issues, heart failure, paralysis, or death, and can spread person to person. Pertussis, which is also known as whooping cough, can also be spread person to person and can result in pneumonia, convulsions, brain damage, and death. Uh, one adult booster of Tdap is publicly funded. Once that client receives TDAP, all other 10-year boosters will be the TDOs. Again, another important reminder here is that individuals lacking adequate documentation of immunization should be considered an Then, Next slide. Hi there, it's Amy here, and I'll be talking to you about the COVID-19 vaccine updates. Uh, so current eligibility in long-term care and retirement homes and hospitals, a primary series is considered to consist of two doses or three doses if uh, immunocompromised and booster doses are a third and a fourth dose and all residents and patients are eligible for a bivalent dose. Um, this vaccine is available for all individuals who do not have any contraindications to receive the vaccine. And just to note, it is recommended that all moderately to severely immunocompromised individuals receive a three dose primary series. Uh, so the schedule, uh, the schedule is the same for healthy individuals as well as immu uh, immunocompromised individuals. Uh, the recommended interval for the primary series is a second dose given 56 days after the first dose. And the minimum interval for the primary series is a second dose given 28 days after the first dose. And for the booster dose, the recommended interval is six months or 168 days after the last dose. And the minimum interval for the booster dose is three months or 84 days after the last dose. So the updates that I have for you for the vaccine availability for this fall is, uh, this is brand new to us. We've had it for about a month or maybe a month and a half. And that's the new bivalent Moderna, uh, Moderna vaccine. And this is the preferred booster due to the antibody response against the original strain Omicron BA1. And it uh, is known to elicit a greater immune response. And coming up right shortly, it was just approved by Health Canada on October the 7th. We don't actually have it in stock yet, but we're expecting it anytime will be the, the Pfizer bivalent product. Uh, so currently what what we are working with uh, at the Southwestern Public Health Region is um, for the monovalent Pfizer vaccine, we have the purple cap. Um, unfortunately, we, we didn't have quite the uptake we were hoping for, so we do have a fair bit of this vaccine still in stock. Uh, and this is the one that requires dilution and um, the expiry time is within six hours of puncture and the vial contains uh, six doses given at a 0 0.3 mil. Uh, so coming up quite shortly, um, hopefully uh, once our, our purple cap stock has depleted, we'll be receiving, and we're all look, really looking forward to this, uh, we'll be receiving the gray cap um, 
monovalent vaccine uh, that we won't have to dilute and it gives us a little bit longer expiry time of 12 hours also contains six doses per vial and given at a 0.3 mil. Currently for Moderna, um, we do have the, the two different products available, the monovalent product, which is given to anyone 12 years of age or older for their primary series, and that contains 10 doses per vial. And now we do have the Royal Blue Cap bivalent vaccine. Um, now this vial contains only five doses per vial and is given to anyone 18 years of age or older. And both of these products uh, must be used within 24 hours of vial puncture. So booster doses, uh, all individuals in Ontario, 18 years of age of, and older, are recommended to receive the bivalent Omicron vaccine. Um, and just hot off the press, the age, eligibil age eligibility will lower to everyone 12 years in age and older on October the 17th. And then um, the difference for the residents of long-term care homes, retirement homes, elder lodges, and those living in congregate settings is that they would be recommended to have the bivalent Omicron product, uh, regardless of the number of boost booster doses they've previously received. So for example, if they had already had four doses or five doses, they would still be eligible to have a dose of the bivalent vaccine. So when ordering your COVID-19 vaccine, uh, we would direct you to our website. Um, our ordering forms are online. Uh, so if you, you visit our webpage and then under the community health section, you'll see all of our order, order forms uh, available to you in that section. And you would click on the vaccine order form that applies, just fill out the online form with all the required information and submit it to Southwestern Public Health. Um, and just a special note, uh, the ministry is no longer supporting single dose uh, syringe delivery anymore. So we will not be providing single doses uh, moving forward. And we're, we would con, um, encourage you to try and, you know, coordinate your residents to be able to make use of as many doses out of a vial as possible when you're ordering um, in order to prevent wastage. Um, and then the pickup for the vaccine would be on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays. Uh, at 410 Buller Street in Woodstock or 1230 Talbot Street in St. Thomas. And you'll notice on the order form that it does, uh, we do ask that you try to give us uh, 48 hours notice to get the vaccine ready for you. And then the requirements, um, the vaccine administration reporting requirements. So document each vaccination administered in the client record in COVAX on, and then submit the end of day report to Southwestern Public Health. And this is also found on our website. And that piece is pretty important to us. Um, the ministry really likes to uh, kind of keep tabs on us on where the doses are going and how many doses are left at the end of it. So we, we really, it makes our life a lot easier if you can get those end of day reports into us uh, in a timely manner. And we really appreciate that. And then uh, frequently asked questions, can the COVID vaccine be given with another vaccine? Example, the influenza vaccine. And the answer is yes, uh, it is safe to receive the COVID vaccine before or after receiving any other vac vaccine for individuals five years of age or older. And then um, what is the ideal time between boosters? Uh, so it is recommended that longer intervals between doses results in a more robust and durable immune response, but also noting that you would follow the Ministry of Health guidelines based on risk. And then how long should an individual wait for a booster after having COVID disease? Uh, that's another question that we get a lot, and the answer varies depending on if an individual has completed their primary series or not. 
So infection after primary series would be a minimum of uh, three months or 84 days after symptom onset. However, a six month or 168 day interval may provide better immune response regardless of the protection given based on clinical discretion. And then for those who are um, immunocompromised, or sorry, those who have not completed a primary series, um, if, you, if you're healthy, uh, you would receive the vaccine two months or 56 days after symptoms, symptom onset or positive test, or um, if you're immunocompromised, the vaccine dose one to two months or 28 to 56 days after symptom onset or a positive test. And references. references. Perfect. So I'm just looking at the, this is Susan, looking at the questions. I feel our slides actually have covered the ones. So flu vaccine can be given any time after COVID disease, as long as the client's feeling better. We've answered COVID vaccine to COVID infection. So just to confirm, the red cap is to be used. So the monovalent is to be used for the primary series. And then the, the bivalent can be used for any booster doses. Whether it's two doses or three doses just depends on the, the client's immune status. And the reason for the monovalence is it actually has more it's stronger. It's got 0 0.2 as opposed to 0 0.1 in the bio. There's, there's another question. I don't know if you've answered oh. it. Uh, if influenza vaccine is administered, can we administer COVID booster vaccine after? Yep. Yeah, they can be the same day, the day. Does, there's, there's no interaction for five and over, which is the population that we're discussing. So there's no time frame between either dose. And then you can give a pneumo 23 in there too, if you want. 